Next up in the protostomes, we have phylum mollusca or the mollusks. This is a huge group of organisms, second only to the arthropods when it comes to diversity, around 150,000 different species. Um, included in this category, we have snails, slugs, clams, and octopi, but so much more on top of that. Mollusca comes from the Latin word for soft. To protect these soft bodies, many mollusks have a shell, though not all. This shell, again, is used for protection. Humans like to collect these shells and use them for things like jewelry, currency, tools, and instruments. Mollusks are all coelomates. And if you remember from last chapter, that means that they do have a true coelom that's completely enclosed in mesoderm. These are some examples of mollusks. There is a whole lot of variation, so this is just a handful as an example. We have a flame scallop in the top left corner that uses its uh, tentacles and such for filter feeding. We have a blue ringed octopus in the top right corner. This is one of the most venomous marine animals out there that releases a potent neurotoxin. Down at the bottom left, we have a chambered nautilus, which has a very protective shell around its body. And then in the bottom right, we've got a banana slug, the second largest slug on earth at around 25 centimeters. The biggest slug is the black sea hare. I did not include the video here because it's a little long, but it is up on canvas if you wanna check that out. It's really big, it's about 20 pounds or so, so huge slug. Mollusks range in size from microscopic to absolutely huge. The biggest is the giant squid that clocks in at over 15 meters. Some get up to 20 meters, 250 kilograms. Most are marine, though there are some freshwater and just a few terrestrial mollusks. The terrestrial mollusks, though, need at least a temporary source of water. Mollusks as a group are an important source of food for humans, especially coastal species. Clams, oysters, scallops, maybe less common to us, squid, octopi, and snails are all utilized for food around the world. Mollusks are also economically significant in other ways. Pearls are produced in oysters when sand or grit becomes trapped between the shell and the mantle and then the oyster wraps it up in a softer substance, a smoother substance to protect its body. Most pearls now are cultured, so um, we're artificially irritating these oysters in order to get pearls. We can also get nacre, or mother of pearl, in the shells of abalone and other mollusks. This is the material that lines the interior of the shell. Mollusks are also beneficial medically. Cone snail venom can be used to treat pain and epilepsy, and scallop eyes have been used as a blueprint for optical devices. Some mollusks are not so beneficial though. They can be pests. The textbook example is the zebra mussel, which got into the Great Lakes as an invasive species and has destroyed native species as well as man-made structures like docks and boats. Down here, we have the apple snail, which is a freshwater snail that has destroyed our native species and vegetation. Mollusks have a basic body plan that has been modified depending on the group and depending on its lifestyle. All mollusks have a mantle, which is a thick epidermal sheet that bounds the mantle cavity. The mantle cavity is a air-filled or water-filled space that is used for a variety of functions, including respiration, filter feeding, dumping waste, keeping eggs safe, and it can contain sensory organs too. The mantle also secretes the shell to protect the mollusk. The mantle itself encloses and protects internal organs. It can form a siphon to create a current of water for the mollusk. It can have sensory organs, and with some mollusks, the mantle can change color for camouflage and communication. 
Mollusks also have a foot, which is the primary means of locomotion for many mollusks, used for attachment, feeding, and digging. Foot can be highly modified. In some mollusks, it is divided into arms or tentacles for much more rapid movement. It can be involved in mucus production, and it can form wing-like projections that allow mollusks to swim. Mollusk has internal organs and a reduced coelom. The organs are concentrated in a visceral mask and visceral mass, not a mask, not going to Mardi Gras. And aquatic mollusks also have gills in order to respirate. Many mollusks also have a shell. This is made out of calcium carbonate, chitin, and proteins. It protects against predators and adverse environments. This, again, is secreted by the outer surface of the mantle. There's an outer portion, which is composed of densely packed crystals, and an inner layer, which is that nacre, or mother of pearl, much smoother against the body of the mollusk. The shell has been reduced, internalized, or out and out lost repeatedly in different groups of mollusks, so it's clearly not an essential structure, though it can be beneficial when it's found. This is the mollusk body plan. The chitin at the top is the ancestral body plan, so this is how mollusks started off, but as you can see from the other pictures, it's been highly modified depending on the group. And we'll talk about those modifications as we talk about these different groups. Mollusks also oftentimes have a radula. This is a rasping tongue-like structure that's used to scrape up algae, kind of like a sand belt. So it's used for feeding. It can be modified. In predatory gastropods, it's used to drill through a shell, and it can also be a harpoon-like structure accompanied by venom. Most mollusks have separate sexes, called gonochoric, if you want to be technical, though a few are hermaphroditic. The hermaphroditic species rely on cross-fertilization. Some mollusks can even change sexes. Depending on the group of mollusks, they will use external or internal fertilization. Marine mollusks rely on external. Gastropods rely on internal fertilization, which has set them up to be able to colonize terrestrial environments. All mollusks are characterized by trochophore larvae, which is a free-swimming larva that swims around with cilia. This also resembles the larva of annelids, worms, which we'll talk about next. This is a picture of that radula. It can have dozens or even hundreds of these teeth that allow it to scrape up all sorts of small particles for the mollusk to feed on. There are seven or eight recognized classes of mollusks, but we're only going to look at the four most species, the polyplacophora or the chitons, these are ancestral, gastropoda, the snails or slugs, gastropoda for stomach foot, bivalvia, the clams, oysters, and scallops, by two valves or shells, cephalopoda, cephalo for head, these are head foot. Squids, octopuses, cuttlefish, and nautiluses are all examples of cephalopoda. Chitons, class polyplacophora, are marine mollusks that have this ancestral body plan, oval bodies that are topped with eight overlapping dorsal calcareous plates, which protect the mollusk from above. The body is not segmented underneath these plates, though the gills can be segmented. These overlapping plates provide flexibility and protection, since they are movable. In addition to that, the chitons have a ventral foot, which you can see here, right here, ventral foot, which is surrounded by a mantle cavity that has gills. These guys are marine, so they live underwater. 
Most chitons are grazing herbivores in the shallows of the oceans. They have a well-developed radula that they use to scrape up algae, bacteria, and other small sessile animals. Class gastropoda include the limpets, snails, slugs, and nudibranchs. They are a primarily marine group, so there are some freshwater species, and they are the only group with terrestrial mollusks. Most of them have a single shell, though it is lost in some, like the slugs and the nudibranchs. They have a foot that's used either for um, creeping around or for swimming. The heads typically have a pair of tentacles with eye stalks that are used for vision. They can sense light, but no color. And most typically have a bottom pair of tentacles that's used for chemoreception. Those will touch the ground, the surface on which they sit, and they can detect the chemicals on that surface. When the shell is present, the shell is usually twisted, torsion is the twisting of the body so the mantle cavity and the anus are moved from the back, the posterior of the body, towards the front where the mouth is located. This may lead to the reduction or even disappearance of organs on usually the right side of the body and to the formation of the mantle cavity with gills, highly vascularized. In terrestrial mollusks, this acts as a rudimentary lung. This torsion kind of looks like coiling, but it's not the same thing. It's this spiral winding of a shell. So here's some examples of gastropods. They are very diverse in their lifestyle and their forms, ranging from predators to grazers. Some don't have a shell. Some have a highly twisted shell. This is a forest snail. These are slugs that are reproducing. They have very complex mating rituals. This slug right here is a great example of the two pairs of tentacles. Top pair is eye stalks, bottom for chemoreception. And then we got the nudibranchs over here, which are marine gastropods that have a very bright color. They actually take the nematocysts of the cnidarians that they ingest and they use them for defense. Next up, we got class bivalvia. Class bivalvia include clams, scallops, mussels, oysters, any mollusk with two shells. Most of these are marine, though some are freshwater. They do not have a radula or a distinct head. They do have a wedge-shaped foot, however, that they use for burrowing and anchoring. It emerges out of the shell. Two shells, valves, are hinged together. Strong adductor muscles will hold these shells closed. If you've ever tried to shuck an oyster, you know how strong these can be. And then two siphons exist, which allow the mollusk to suck in water and then to push out water, creating a current for filter feeding and also creating a current for respiration. Mollusks also, mollusks, bivalves also have gills that they use for filtering food and for um, diffusion. These guys are sessile filter feeders, so they typically have very few sensory structures. They don't move around much, so they don't need to tell which way they're going or what's going on around them. They do have some chemoreceptors, typically, and some, like scallops, do have eyes. So here's some examples of bivalves. We got that shucked oyster right here. You can see that nacre or mother of pearl lining the shell. This is the biggest bivalve out there. The scallop has eyes. These little blue structures are the eyes, photoreceptor units. And then this cockle is a great example of the siphons that the bivalve uses to create a current of water within the organism. Stay tuned for cephalopods. We're nearing the 15 minute mark, so I will create a separate small lecture to talk about those.